We're happy you are with us on this sure Wednesday are. morning. Wednesday. All right. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I forgot already. I'm Joe Pryor. <laughs> and I'm Savannah Sellers. This morning, we're going to get started with the legal battle over Texas's controversial immigration law. So oral arguments are set to begin today in federal appeals court on the Biden administration's effort to block the law known as SB4. A lot happened yesterday. For a moment, Texas was allowed to enforce the law. Then it wasn't. This contentious law would allow local police to arrest migrants who cross the the border illegally from Mexico and impose criminal penalties. It would also empower state judges to order people to be deported to Mexico. Now, earlier this month, the Supreme Court issued a temporary freeze on the law until justices could consider the case. Then yesterday, those justices ruled that Texas could enforce the law until a lower court, the federal appeals court, issued its ruling on the matter. Well, that didn't take long. Just hours later, that appeals court unexpectedly opposed a new block on the law last night and is now expected to hear arguments on the case today. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley has the latest on all this. Also, NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos is here to break it all down because it's a little confusing. So, Julia, let's start with you. A lot of back and forth going on in this case, especially yesterday. What are you watching for today? How soon could this appeals court issue a decision? a lot of whiplash right now, but what it's really coming down to is that we may actually have a court that weighs in on the merits of whether or not SB4 should stand, rather than having debates about whether or not it should be on hold pending those oral arguments. In fact, it was at first, we heard earlier this week, the Supreme Court said, let's issue a stay indefinitely. We thought that might stick for months. Um, and then, obviously, they were really just buying themselves enough time to say, you know what, actually, it can go into effect pending what the Fifth Circuit does. We thought that might last a while. Now the Fifth Circuit is saying it should go on hold and scheduling those oral arguments so that hopefully the Biden administration, the advocates, and Texas will be able to come bring their cases here about why this law should or should not stand. But yes, it's a lot of whiplash overnight, waking up to this news, trying to figure out whether or not this law can go into effect. And why do we care so much? Because it's a radical change, a radical departure from the way the U.S. has carried out immigration law for the last 150 years, because it has fallen to the federal government, not the state government, to be able to arrest people who they think came into the country illegally. And really, states haven't been trained in that law, much less, uh, not their police and much less their judges. Danny, let's hear more about the Supreme Court's decision. What are the implications there of that? And then also tell us as we move ahead and look to actually this appellate court, what this means in terms of the Biden administration's argument, as well as from what we're hearing from Texas. The Supreme Court's decision was really a non-decision. It essentially sent it back to the Circuit Court of Appeals, and that's who has it right now. But what was really interesting about the Supreme Court was its dissenting opinions, where the three liberal justices made very clear that not only would they have taken this case up, but they said signaled exactly what direction they would go. So you could say that the conservative justices didn't give us any signal by simply sending the case back to the Fifth Circuit. Mm. But the three liberal justices, who are a minority and they're just dissenting, and a dissenting opinion is basically has no force. It's basically just lodging your objection. Uh, they told us that pretty clearly that they would uh, go against this Texas law. So what that means effectively now is the that Texas can enforce the law, which is going to be problematic because it is inconsistent with federal immigration law. So, Julia, if this law does go into effect after everything we hear in the courts, does Texas even have the resources and capacity to handle the arrest? And on top of that, Mexican officials said yesterday they won't accept deportation. So where would Texas even send those who are deported? Yeah, that's a big question. I talked to Texas Department of Public Safety yesterday, just after the Supreme Court decision, and they said they still needed to gather together with the key stakeholders and especially decide when they could start rolling that out. And Texas DPS is one part of that. You also have to think of the many local police across the state of Texas, including in small rural areas, who might not have the capacity to enforce this law. As of yesterday, when they thought this could go into effect, they didn't have a concrete date. It was not immediate, but they said it could be as soon as tomorrow, meaning today, before we heard from the Fifth Circuit. So a lot in flux in Texas, but Mexico has staunchly come out against us. A foreign minister said yesterday they think that this is inhumane. They think that this violates human rights. 
whereas uh, the, a top Mexican official came out on Twitter and said, we will not accept deportations. And the Texas law has set up so that anyone who is given a deportation order would go back to Mexico. It's not clear that they would be able to establish the individual authorities they need to send people back to their home countries. For example, if someone came from Venezuela, the U.S. can't even send anyone back to Venezuela right now. How would Texas then establish that authority and get Venezuela to accept those people? Uh, really, a lot of the, the practicalities have not yet been sorted out. Danny, what are the broader legal implications here? Should this be able to move forward, even after we get the appeals court decision, given, as both you and Julia smartly pointed out, that you know, this is not standard practice. This is not how it's done across multiple different states that are along the border. What would this mean here as we move forward for immigration policy? That this case is this mired in appeals is a surprise to me because it seems to me a pretty uh, straightforward constitutional issue. The federal government has exclusive authority to dictate immigration policy. And there's a very good reason for that. It's why we have certain things that are left exclusively to the federal government. Imagine if every state decided coining its own money or printing its own dollar bills. It would be a disaster. Imagine if uh, different countries had to negotiate immigration policy. You just heard Julia. Julia's reporting on Mexico's negotiation with America about its immig our immigration policy and how they feel about this Texas law. Imagine if Mexico had to negotiate with every border state individually as if it was a separate sovereign. These are certain things, powers that the states gave up to be part of the United States. It seemed to be a pretty settled issue. The Supreme Court weighed in on this back during the Papers, Please, Arizona case. Uh, I'm surprised it's gotten this far. But the danger is that if allowed to persist, this Texas law could create a patchwork set of immigration law, which is really anathema to the Constitution itself. So I'd be really surprised if Texas ends up prevailing here. See what happens. Julia and Danny, thank you both for breaking mm -hmm. it down for us this morning. We appreciate it. Well, this morning, Donald Trump is celebrating a big win in Ohio. NBC News is projecting Bernie Marino, a former car dealer and Trump-backed candidate, has won Ohio's Republican Senate nomination. Marino defeated Matt Dolan and Frank LaRose, who were considered more traditional Republican candidates. Marino will now face incumbent three-term Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown in November. For more on this, we're joined by NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell and NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. Thank you both for being here. That's right, Mark. Let's get it started with you. Obviously, a big night for the former president and the MAGA movement in Ohio again, because this was his backed candidate who, who did take this. What's your reaction to what we saw in the Buckeye State? And also, what do you think about how this is going to stack up against Sherrod Brown? Yeah, so this was a re another reminder last night that the Republican Party is Donald Trump's party. What we ended up seeing in the exit poll was that Moreno ended up doing really well among the very conservative as well as non-college voters, the same types of core voters in Donald Trump's base. Uh, and uh, this, in a lot of ways, was a replay of what we ended up seeing in 2022 when then-Trump-backed uh, 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 J.D. Vance won a three-way Republican primary for the U.S. Senate on the Republican side. And Matt Dolan was also in that contest with another traditional Republican as well. Um, and so, Savannah, I do think that this is just another reminder of how this is Donald Trump's party and how this stacks up for the general election. It's worth noting this is going to be one of the key races that will decide control the United States uh, Senate. Sherrod Brown is one of the more formidable Democratic uh, incumbents, uh, but he's going to end up needing a lot of ticket splitters in a state that Donald Trump will probably be favored to win in a general election. So, Mark, I mean, Democrats really aren't complaining about this in this Ohio Senate race. National Democrats actually put yeah. millions of dollars behind ads for Moreno, thinking he's the easiest candidate to defeat. At the same time, as you mentioned, Ohio seems to be getting redder and redder each election. So what do you think of this strategy of Democrats pushing Trump back candidates in the primary, thinking the Democrats will win in the yeah. general? How effective has it been in the past? Well, so in the past, it worked for someone like Claire McCaskill in 2012, elevating the person who you actually see as maybe the weakest uh, opponent. And so Democrats did pinpoint Moreno and thinking that he was a potentially weaker general election candidate uh, than uh, Dolan or even LaRose. And so we saw that in advertising. And some of the ads were saying that the, the Trump-backed, uh, very conservative Bernie Moreno uh, and trying to get him out 
out uh, it, it, to, for, for Republican voters to know that. Uh, but again, in 2000, in 2020, Donald Trump won Ohio by eight percentage points. And so that's going to be the brutal math for Sherrod Brown, where he is going to end up needing a considerable number of Donald Trump, Sherrod Brown voters in a political world where there are very, uh, there are fewer and fewer ticket splitters. Kelly, let's bring you in here. Keep talking politics. President Biden is out west campaigning. This is part of a three-day tour through Arizona and Nevada. Specifically here, he's looking to drum up support among Latino voters. It's an area where Republicans have been making inroads. So what is on the president's agenda today, and what is the White House saying about this specific push? Well, good morning and good to be with you. This is a part of the campaign season where the Biden campaign is working on trying to build the coalitions with affinity groups and constituencies that they believe are essential to their ability to get the math to win. And so that is some of the work that's going on, that outreach to Latinos in Nevada and Arizona. The president will also be in Texas. And doing that is a way to try to connect. And the president also spoke in Phoenix about how much he needs the support of voters in these critical states and especially within these critical communities because it could make the critical difference. Here's the president. You know, last time, you're the reason I, in large part, I beat Donald Trump. Yes. Let's beat him again. Well, you know, we, I need you. I need you badly. I need the help. Kamala and I desperately need your help because, look, there's only about six or seven states that are going to determine the outcome of this election. There are toss-up states. This is one of them. And he's speaking there in Phoenix. So Arizona was, of course, part of the essential math for his victory last time and a state where they believe they have to keep that, maintain it, and build on it where possible. So outreach to those sort of communities is a big part of what we're seeing in the month of March and perhaps somewhat into April before they go on to expand in other ways. Mm. So long elections have seasons, and right now it's about building those coalitions. Kelly O'Donnell and Mark Murray, thank you both very much. Today, a GOP-led House committee looking into the business dealings of President Biden's son, Hunter, is scheduled to hold a hearing, but without two star witnesses. Hunter Biden, who had originally requested a public hearing, is now refusing to appear today at the hearing being held by the Republican-controlled House Oversight and Judiciary Committees. It's entitled Influence Peddling, Examining Joe Biden's Abuse of Public Office. Biden's lawyer dismissed the hearing as a carnival sideshow. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Sirkin joins us now with the latest. Good morning. So Hunter Biden's one of the main witnesses who won't be there today. The other is Devin Archer, a business associate of the president's son. So why not? Didn't Hunter Biden ask for a public hearing? He did ask for a public hearing. His lawyers asked for a public hearing from the Republican-led committee for months. This is back when the committee wanted to hear from Hunter Biden behind closed doors. Eventually, you'll remember Hunter Biden, after coming to the Hill, making some unprompted appearances before the press, he did end up testifying for more than six hours uh, before the committee behind closed doors at the end of last month. Well, now his lawyers are saying that they are not going to continue taking part in a, quote, political charade. He called it a baseless conspiracy uh, witch hunt and probe by this committee. His lawyers say, however, if the oversight panel, again, led by Republican firebrands, decides to bring in family members of former President Trump, then Hunter Biden, his lawyer says, would consider sitting before the committee in a public setting. You talk about Devin Archer as well. That's for a little bit of a different reason. His lawyer actually says that the committee notified his client way too late and he's far too busy in his schedule in order to accommodate a hearing that is designed essentially uh, to be a charade and sort of dramatize this issue, guys. So, Julie, Devin Archer, who Joe had mentioned, didn't we see him testify last year in a closed door meeting and hear him say that he was not aware of any wrongdoing is ultimately what we think came out of that. Has the committee indicated what else is new here that they hope to learn from interviewing him again? Well, they hope that Devin Archer, like the other witnesses, like the other business associates of Hunter Biden, would somehow help bolster this claim that they have. They have yet to prove uh, that the president benefited uh, or the president, excuse me, used and shaped his foreign policy in office and before he got into office as vice president uh, and before that potentially as Senate uh, to help his son in his business dealings. That's a connection they have yet 
to prove, but Devin Archer and some of the other witnesses that'll be testifying today, they have said behind closed doors, Devin Archer telling the committee last July, uh, that yes, Hunter Biden perhaps threw his father's name around, but that the relationship did not go the other way around. So Julie, who will testify at the hearing today? Yeah, two guys, two business associates of Hunter Biden. One of them is actually going to testify from prison, Jason Galanis. He's serving uh, a 14-year term for fraud. So he won't be there physically, but he will be there via video. The other one, Tony Bobolinsky, he is another business associate of Hunter Biden who testified before the committee behind closed doors for hours. We've seen that parts of that transcript. Both of the men have also sat before the panel behind closed doors before. They have both again said that, yes, Hunter Biden may have used his father's name in conversations, but that, again, that evidence that the president himself, that Joe Biden himself had shaped foreign policy in any way uh, to benefit his son was just not conclusive there. But we will see an empty chair additionally for Hunter Biden with his name on it. Again, the committee trying to dramatize this event. Julie, quickly while we have you, let's get a TikTok update. Today, national security officials are holding a closed door briefing for senators on the Commerce and Intelligence Committee. So this is after the House overwhelmingly passed that bill that would force TikTok's parent company to sell off the app within six months or face a ban. And the big question about what's next has been over this bill's future in the Senate. Does the fact that we are seeing this briefing happen mean that we're a step closer to potentially actually seeing a vote in the Senate on this? Yeah, but there's certainly a lot of pressure, especially from the White House, coming to the Senate, asking them to take up this House passed bill, which I know you covered extensively, Savannah. And so this morning at around 1045, the Senate Intelligence Committee, the Senate Commerce Committee, these are really the panels that would have jurisdiction over not only TikTok, but its national security implications on Americans, on the U.S. government as well. They're going to have a chance, the members of these panels, to sit behind closed doors to hear classified briefing from top intelligence officials in the Biden administration to lay out why this ban, uh, why this uh, bill should go forward now, why they should fast track this process, much like the House did. What are the national security implications of millions of Americans who use TikTok, who use potentially other apps that are controlled by foreign adversaries? that data collection, what that could potentially uh, be used for. These are all the questions that senators on these committees want answers to, especially because they are being asked, again, to push full steam ahead and pass this legislation through the Senate, legislation that the president indicated he would sign swiftly. All right, Julie Serkin, thank you so much. Let's turn now to the economy. The Federal Reserve is expected to announce its latest interest rate decision today. In 2022 and the first half of 2023, the central bank raised rates 11 times to get inflation under control. Since then, no hikes, but also no cuts. We have Investopedia editor-in-chief Caleb Silver here in studio with us to preview what today's decision could mean for our economy. I thought you didn't like us for a minute there. We haven't seen you in studio in a minute. I've been everywhere. I know. I'm you were on tour. He, he was here while you were gone. Okay. okay. Well, I haven't seen you in a minute. <laughs> Caleb, what are you expecting to see the Federal Reserve do today? Yeah, they are not going to change rates today. They have been pretty clear about that. But words matter. And the words that Jerome Powell says in the press conference after the decision at 2 o'clock are what we're going to be paying attention to, but also the charts, particularly the summary of economic projections. That tells us how many times the Fed thinks it needs to cut rates this year. How's GDP? How's the economy doing right now? How's, how's unemployment? And when you look through those things, that checklist, GDP is pretty strong. We thought mm. these higher rates would tip us into a recession. GDP clocking in around 3.3 percent. Inflation still higher than the Fed wants, 3.2 percent. And the unemployment rate below 4 percent. That's full employment. So the economy is in good shape and they haven't had to cut rates yet. Powell has said that lowering the rates too quickly could risk us losing this battle against inflation that we've been fighting for the last two years. What is the line that the Fed is trying to sort of straddle yeah. mm. here? If they lower rates too quickly, it's going to stimulate a lot of buying, right? We haven't been buying homes or selling homes. We haven't been buying a lot of cars because rates have been so high. Spending is held in, but if rates go lower, people are going to want to spend more. That's just going to cause companies to raise prices again, and then you get back into that inflation gerbil wheel where you just can't get out. Mm. So they're going to be uh, very careful about when, they're, when they cut rates. And that looks like probably June right now, the June 1st meeting in 45 days, <laughs> 6 hours and 42 minutes. <laughs> I was going to ask days, for a countdown clock. Um, what does this mean for the average American at home? And is this any indication when we could see those rate cuts? Is people waiting to buy homes or whatever? When yeah. do we think that could We're happen? We're starting to see a little crack in the home buying market. It started last month. We started to see existing home sales selling again, building permits rising again. We need that mortgage rate to come down to like five and a half, six percent before you get that activity. But it's the credit card debt that I want to pay attention to because credit card APRs, they're north of 20 percent. Families, households are hanging in, especially those that own homes and have stocks. 
Those prices have gone up. Lower income folks have not done as well, but we are not nearing a great financial crisis type situation right now. Mm. All right. Caleb Silver, as always, great to see you. Thanks for coming. New storm systems are set to bring more snow and showers to much of the country. So let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Well, Andrew Lastman's in studio with us. Hey, Andrew, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. We've got some snow to talk about in a couple of spots across the country over the coming days. This morning, we're still seeing some of that lake effect snow happening across the Great Lakes region, downwind of Erie and Ontario. You can see some of that snow still falling across parts of Michigan as well. That's where you'll find some of these winter alerts still up. And again, downwind of the lakes in both New York and Pennsylvania. We'll slowly but surely start to see this system kicking out, but through the day today, still dealing with a bit of that snow. We could even see some of these showers working across uh, basically places from Boston to Philadelphia here as we get through the afternoon hours today. Impressive amounts of snow. You're going to have to look up to the northern portions of Maine. That's where we'll see upwards of four to six, maybe even eight inches in isolated amounts higher than that as we get through the next couple of days. In the meantime, we're going to watch the middle of the country for a couple other things going on. We've got a low pressure system that's moving out of, uh, out of Canada uh, and bringing the potential for some snow showers across parts of the northern Rockies and the northern plains today. Across parts of the south, we'll see this other low pressure system that'll kind of start some rumbles of thunder, uh, some showers, some thunderstorm potential will be there here even as we get into the day tomorrow. Uh, and it'll really ramp up as we head into Friday. But notice there's more snow on tap for tomorrow for that same area, the northern plains. As we look ahead to your Friday, we see this snow work across parts of the Midwest and the Great Lakes. It does intensify, so we'll see a, a good amount amount of snow in some of those spots. And on top of that, the southeast will start to see some of that heavy rain working in and the storm potential too will focus along parts of the Gulf Coast. And then unfortunately, just in time for your Saturday plans, looks like it'll be a soggy uh, start to the weekend here across parts of the eastern seaboard. And then we'll also be dealing with parts of northern New England picking up some heavy kind of wet snow. And I know what you're thinking. I thought it was spring. Yeah, well, it's early spring, so we still have that snow potential until temperatures really start to surge uh, in, the, in the coming week. As far as rain is concerned, I think the higher amounts will be places like Texas along the East Coast, parts of Southern Florida. Uh, we'll see maybe two to three inches. And you can see there's a good uh, dose of rain in store for much of this region here as we get through your Saturday. Now, snowfall, it looks like those higher amounts, nine inches, maybe a foot in some spots. But overall, we're going to have to look to parts of northern Maine, maybe parts of the Dakotas to see some of those higher amounts. Otherwise, places like Detroit, Buffalo, Boston, and could see maybe an inch or so by the time we get into the weekend. Uh, the rain and the wind is on tap for your Saturday, but guys, look at that. The spring sunshine returns for the east. We'll have to deal with the, the wet, cold snow for parts of the other half of the country as we get into Sunday. So not really spring in some yeah. parts of the country. <laughs> and that's how you sum it up. So bizarre, yeah. All, right. All right. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.